Welcome everybody. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we have a very exciting evening planned with Mr. Nathan Hill, uh, the author of The Nix, which we read in our November book club. Um, the book club is across 12 countries. We have 60,000 members and we all meet up to discuss the same book at the same time. So like I said, Nathan Hill was our author for November. And I have a ton of questions for you, Nathan, but if you want to do a little intro, just a little bit about yourself and maybe writing the book. Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, thanks. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you, everybody who's joining us tonight. And thanks to everybody who read the book for the book club. I was uh, uh, honored when, uh, when I got the email that it had been selected. So thanks so much. Um, I know it's a daunting thing asking somebody to read 620 page novel in a month. So thanks to everybody who, who got through it. <laughs> and I'm sorry uh, if it caused any stress. Um, uh, I, I've, I've been kind of touring around the country for the last year and a half and uh, I was mentioning to Aaron before we, we came on that, uh, that I've met all these book clubs all over the, all over the country and some of them um, are very, very friendly and social and it's about like, um, it's about sort of about the book but it's also about like good wine and hanging out with friends um, and then some book clubs are incredibly cutthroat and, uh, and, they, and like people have, um, you know, like tenured members that nominate new members who have a one-year waiting period before they become a tenured member of the book club and there are all these rules. Um, anyway, it's been so, one of the like really interesting um, things that, uh, 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 that that's happened on this on this tour this last year and a half is meeting all these book clubs who come to my readings and, and talk about what what the experience was like uh, at their respective groups. So thanks everybody for for doing that this November. I really appreciate it. Sorry. I had to unmute myself. <laughs> um, well, I know we have lots of questions. For everybody who's just joining us, please ask your questions in the right-hand um, side of the screen. There is a, a chat function, or you can even put your hands up, although not very many of you have your videos on, I'm sad to say, but you can put your hand up and ask live or just by voice, so that's definitely an option. We want it to be super interactive. Uh, we did receive a lot of um, questions by email, so we'll be asking those. Sarah, thank you. Welcome. Hi, sorry. We have, we have a live person. <laughs> um, so we'll be asking those of Nathan. But uh, Nathan, the first question I have for you personally is that your book gained a lot of notoriety before it was ever even published. And um, you had a New York Times article that came out before it actually published and it sold in 16 countries before it was published. So, and, and of course your relationship with John Irving, and I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit to what it's like to have so much anticipation for a book. Yeah, that was really strange. Um, I had been ritualistically ignored by the publishing world for about 15 years, okay. uh, and so, um, uh, and, and rightfully so, like the, the stuff I was, I was putting out before the Knicks did not deserve much attention. Um, and uh, and I, had, I, for a long time, had kind of retreated from the publishing world. I had I'd kind of given up on, on sending stuff out to magazines and to agents and so forth. And I was really just writing this book, this very, very long book that took a very long time to write. Um, and, and it got to the point where it was, you know, I, my, my wife, who had been re reading it along with me as I, as, I, as I wrote it, she was very excited about it. And I, I kept on feeling like I had to tamp down the excitement because, you know, I'm, a, I'm an author that nobody's ever heard of. And it's a 600 plus page book, you know, and, uh, and so um, these kinds of things aren't generally popular. And then, uh, and then it started, yeah, it started happening. Um, the, the book, my, my agent sent the book out uh, um, to publishers and it was picked up by Knopf in a week, I think. Um, and then the machine just started rolling and we started getting all these really positive, um, uh, uh, all this positive feedback from independent booksellers and from librarians. And there, there was just this very slow kind of groundswell of support, which was unbelievable and unexpected um, and, uh, and, and, and sort of surreal. Like I couldn't, I, I kind of couldn't believe it was happening. I was still like going about my normal regular life, but I kept on getting updates from my publisher about how all this stuff was happening. Um, so, uh, and then, and then the, the, the most surreal moment was the New York Times article that you, that you mentioned where they, they interviewed John Irving who said very nice things. And, and, um, and I, I, I was driving, um, I was driving back home um, uh, from visiting my parents. I was driving with my wife. We were, 
making our way through Florida. We, had, we were stopping overnight because it's a long trip. Um, and we were in Florida. We had found this like brewery right, in the, right, on, like, right on the water. And so we were like having good beers at this brewery, watching the sunset over the water. And I swear to God, like we see a couple dolphins like <laughs> jumping in the distance. And I get a text from my, my publicist about <laughs> article that's when I read it for the first time in this situation so I'm just like I felt like honestly like there was a, a, a good like 20% of me that thought somebody that I maybe have wronged in the past is playing an elaborate joke on me <laughs> long time a long time to get over that well it's certainly incredible excuse me <clears throat> it's a not a, the normal trajectory of a new author new book but Ironically, um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about Samuel, but I mean, Samuel's story is very um, similar to your own. Uh, sort of. I mean, uh, the difference between us is that Samuel, um, uh, I, I think, well, I think Samuel is a little less, um, hopefully a little less self-aware. Hopefully I'm a little more self-aware than, than Samuel. Fair enough. <laughs> and, and Samuel also, uh, he, um, he, he he wants to be he wants to be a famous writer, but he doesn't want to put in any work. You know, he has uh, he has completed this one short story that uh, that he had published uh, for as we learned dubious reasons, um, and he hasn't really earned anything. Um, and I think that was definitely me um, coming out of say college. You know, um, I came out uh, you know all, writing very teacher pleasing stories and thought, oh, this is going to be easy. Um, and, uh, and, and didn't know exactly how much work it required to not only write a, write a long book, but write a book that, that people would really want to devote some, some time and attention to. So I, I, think, I think Samuel is me circa 2004, you know, um, when, I, when, I thought, when I thought this whole publishing thing would be easy. Fair enough. And we, we have to draw the comparisons, of course, of the English professor and also the gaming. I, I've read that those are two things that might have a little bit to do with you as well. Yeah. So um, uh, all this time that I've, I've been working on the book, I've also been teaching. I, I teach first year writing or I taught first year writing uh, uh, composition courses. Uh, and, um, and so I get all, you know, all disciplines in these courses. They're just like basic required first year. Here's how to write an essay in college type of courses. Um, and I kind of love them. And, uh, and I, I enjoyed teaching them. Um, Samuel doesn't, of course. Samuel is very similar. About um, but uh, I, I, um, I, I couldn't. I couldn't make him really love his job. There's not a whole lot of drama there. So I, I made him sort of uh, upset and resentful about the whole thing. Um, but yeah, I, I was a teacher for a very long time. I did that for about 10 years while I was writing, writing the book. And, um, and I, sh I should say that a lot, of, a lot of my students were very, most of my students were very hardworking, wonderful young people. Um, but there were a few, like every semester, I'd have like two or three students who just struck me as just like, I'm not sure why they're in college. I'm not sure what they're doing here. They're like not coming to class and like plagiarizing their essays. And, 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 and Laura Potsdam was born out of those experiences. Out of, out of I, I collected maybe, you know, 12 or 15 of my most challenging experiences with students and kind of put them all into one character and that became Laura. Um, and yeah, and, and there was also a time in my life when I was playing um, a video game called World of Warcraft. Um, and I was playing it kind of a lot. It was, it was after I moved to New York City in 2004, uh, I, I, um, and, I, I, and I got robbed. Um, I, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a day when I was moving apartments and uh, I, I had to be out of one apartment in the morning, but I couldn't move into an, my other apartment until the evening. And so I put all my stuff in the car because I was a poor grad student and all my stuff could fit in my car. Um, and, uh, and then and went to work and, and came back to my car intending to move into my new place and everything was, had been stolen during the day, oh, um, including, yeah, including the computer on which uh, I, I had all of my writing from my MFA program was on. Uh, so like three years of writing was just gone. And this was like before the cloud and I had, I had backed up I had backed up all of my writing on discs that were stupidly right next to the computer, so they were stolen too. Um, so I had just zero writing, um, and uh, and you know I I kind of dreamed about moving to New York City for a long time. I was like I, I was like a you know kid growing up in the suburban Midwest, and I had always thought I'm going to get to New York City someday, and then I do. In the first month I was there, this happens. It was really depressing, and uh, and. 
a friend of mine who was just worried about my mental health suggested this video game because we could play it together and he could kind of chat with me while we played and he would kind of keep an eye on me. Um, it was very <laughs> sweet. So he, he told me to go play, to get this game World of Warcraft. I had never heard of it, but I went and, I went and bought it and played it and got really deeply into it. Uh, and even when, like six, eight months later when my friend stopped playing, I kind of kept going. Um, for a couple years, played it like really kind of hardcore, like really a lot. Um, and looking back on it, I didn't think I, th I thought of it this way at the time, but looking back on it, you know, it was the time when like things were not going very well. I didn't, I, you know, I, 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 um, all of my writing had been stolen and the new stuff that I was doing just didn't feel quite right. Um, it wasn't getting any traction. New York was very difficult to live in. Um, I was working at the time at a poetry nonprofit, so you can imagine what my salary was. Um, so it was, it was tough to make sense. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so things were going poorly, but at the end of the day, I could fire up this video game and be good at it and, and meet other people who valued that. And like we were this community together. And that was really, really powerful. Um, but then eventually, like a couple years later, I, I ended up quitting it because it's a game that just like to be really, really good at it takes so much time. And I was I began resenting how much time it took away from real life. So I, I, I ended up quitting. But my kind of love hate relationship, my ambiguous feelings about the game that I loved that it got me through a dark time, but I hated kind of how embarrassing it is to be an adult who's playing a lot of video games. Um, uh, I, I liked that ambiguity. So that's how Ponage was born. Um, uh, and, uh, and I wanted to investigate that, like what happens when you really go down the rabbit hole with a, with a game like this. It, I mean, the book is brilliant. I, that's my, my personal feelings about the book. Okay. You're, you're writing, you're, you're incredibly gifted. But um, for, for that specific character, I mean, I loved him. And you, you really do split our membership in that some people couldn't stand the gaming portion of the book and some people absolutely loved it. So, I mean, I know nothing about gaming. So to me, it was fascinating. Well, it was, that was a tricky character. Um, uh, Ponage was, was, was difficult to write because I know that for most people, the only thing more boring than watching somebody else play a video game is reading about somebody else. <laughs> so I, I get that. Um, and, and part of me just never wanted to write about it because I don't know, I feel like, <clears throat> especially young writers uh, sort of, search for permission to write about the things they want to write about and and uh and so I, I was looking around for how other writers that i maybe respected how did they write about video games um and this and the pickings are slim you know there are very very few novels out there that take video games seriously um and 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 so for a long time it felt like i couldn't write about it because I, nobody had given me permission to um and eventually i just decided screw it, nobody's ever gonna read this book anyway, so I'm gonna do what I want. Uh, <laughs> and then everybody read the book. <laughs> oh, that's a surprising thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, before, um, I have so many questions from other people that I, and I'm completely hogging the spotlight here, but before we get into any of um, these questions, one thing that I did wanna address is the length of the book. And I mean, I know a little bit about the history, but. Um, if you could just share how long it took you to write and kind of what was that, what does that look like? Yeah, well, it, it, I, I say it, it took 10 years, which is true. I mean, the first words that I wrote for the Knicks were, were the, um, uh, I wrote in 2004, and then I finished a, I, I finished, um, a, a draft, I finished a revision uh, in 2014, um, the first big revision on it in 2014. So I say it took 10 years. Now, there were a couple years in there where um, I was... Uh, I was teaching, I was a brand new teacher, and so that was taking a whole lot of time. And anybody out there who's a comp teacher knows that, you know, you have 100 students a semester, and they're each turning in a six-page essay. So every weekend, you have 600 pages of reading to get through. So there's not a whole lot of time for writing in there. So I was writing where I could. Um, but still, and, and, and for a couple of years, I really didn't know what I was doing, you know? Like, I, I, was, I was just kind of um, spinning my spinning my wheels until I figured out what the book was really about. Um, but then once I did figure it out, um, it, it, it you know it was several years of writing, and I guess all I can say is I never intended to write. It wasn't my intention to write this. I'm you know I'm going to write an American epic. I'm going to write this massive uh, doorstopper. It was much more. Um, this was a story. This was the story I wanted to tell, and this was 
just the way the book shaped up. You know, like, I wanted to be able to talk about Faye in 1968. I wanted to be able to talk about um, Bethany and Bishop in 1988. Now, I wanted these these pieces in, in the book because I thought I thought they, they all added up to, to the way I ended it. And so, I, you know, I, I recognized somewhere along the way, maybe year seven, that I was writing a long book. And in fact, like this, this group of friends my wife and I go on vacation with every summer, we've been doing it for like 12 years now. Um, one of my friends, like at year seven, said, how long is your book now? Because I've been talking about it every year, still writing the book. And I, by that time, I was like, the manuscript's like 800 pages. And she just looked at me and, and like shook her head very very forlornly and then she said Nathan nobody's ever going to want to read that <laughs> which is like all of my fears coming true um but again kind of getting back to where my head was when I wrote it um I was thinking essentially I thought that if if it's highly unlikely that anybody's going to want to buy the book anyway I might as well write the book I want to read I might as well write a book that I, I really enjoy the process of writing it and so and so that's what I did um, and, and yeah it meant that uh, it ended up, the, the first draft was about a thousand pages long and um, and uh, I cut it with the help of my agent my editor cut it cut about 400 pages of it um, and um, the last edit that I did with my editor we we went through every single page with the goal of cutting one sentence per page um, just just thinking that if we could cut one sentence per page, then it would make the book another 10 to 20 pages shorter, you know? Um, and so we really interrogated every sentence. And it, it might be silly to say uh, of a 620 page book, and I know some of your members might laugh at this, but, it, but I feel like all the sentences uh, belong. I think they, they, they've all been interrogated and I like them all. So um, I'm sorry if it took a long time, but, but, uh, but I, I feel like it's as tight as I can possibly tell this particular story. Going back to um, when you started writing it, like characters like Laura, like did they have to change dramatically over the 10 years? <laughs> yeah, they did. Um, and, and the thing that happens with these kinds of characters, Laura and Ponage, especially also um, Periwinkle a, a great deal, um, and, uh, and, and the police officer, Charlie Brown, you know, is, is that when they first appear, they're very two-dimensional, and and they're in, in some ways they were just um, they were just there for you know maybe like plot reasons um, or or uh, I just thought like a, a love triangle in 1968 would be kind of sexy, and so maybe I'll try this. And uh, and they're very two-dimensional, and and you can feel it on the page. And then you start you start asking yourself questions. So with Laura, for example, you start asking like like. I can't just make her like the cheating student because that's that's gonna your the reader will see that I have all this disdain for this character and that's no good. She doesn't seem real. So um, so I got to thinking. Well, what explains Laura's behavior? Why is she cheating on all these things? Like what's going on in her life? What has led her to this place? Um, in what way does she describe herself in her mind as the good guy in the story of her life? Because we always want to explain ourselves as the good guy in the story of our lives. So. Um, why is that true? And, and so, I don't know, it's this interesting process where you get to know characters and hopefully have more empathy for them. Um, and, uh, and, and they become a little more three-dimensional, they become a little more real, um, and, uh, and you kind of forgive them uh, any, of, any of their flaws. And so, so I, I love that process. It's the same process that happens with friends that you make, new friends, you know, you, you, you get to know them in a deeper and deeper way over time. That's kind of the same thing that happens with these characters. So I feel like, you know, I really love Laura. I really love, I mean, Ponage is dear to me. Um, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and so these people like started as kind of plot fixes, but they hopefully ended up as like whole characters. I think the characters are so well described and so well developed and I mean such social commentary at the same time. Um, was that really important to you? Uh, sort of. Um, I know when I started writing the book, I, w it was, I was, I don't know, a, a kind of very politically aggressive young man. And, <laughs> and, I, and I, I was, I know that the, the, the first, you know, couple hundred I wrote for the book were, were like kind of, I don't know, sanctimonious, I guess I would call them. Um, I was, I was just kind of angry at the political situation in the U.S. and, uh, and, and sort of venting a little bit uh, via fiction. Um, and that, that, 
that might make make a good op-ed, but I don't think it makes very good literature. Um, and uh, and so over time, I think that social commentary kind of I pulled back on it a little bit, and it was much less like I don't know trying to like serve my anger. It wasn't really about um, uh, trying to show how I was right about something. It was mostly just I wanted to kind of show how the world felt as, uh, you know, it, as I lived it, how it felt on one's nerve endings, you know? Um, and, uh, and there are some ridiculous, absurd things out in the world. And, uh, and, and, and so I, I, I got great joy out of, out of pointing at them. Um, I don't know if I'm serving any kind of great social cause, but, uh, but I, I, I know that I, for example, you know, that scene where, uh, um, where, Samuel is walking through the airport and he's looking at all these. Hey, can you stop the question for a while? I'm doing good. Hello? Sorry, just a sec. There's um, a little noise on the line. There we go. We should be good. No problem. Um, uh, that scene in the airport, is, it was great fun uh, because airports are ridiculous. The things that you can buy at airports are ridiculous. Um, and, uh, and so I thought, well, what fun it is to, to, uh, uh, to, to have a kind of doppelganger with the scene where Samuel's walking through the mall trying to buy uh, something for Bethany and he sees all the stuff on display that you can buy and can't find anything that he really wants. It's kind of the same experience in the airport. So I don't know, like uh, um, uh, a lot of this stuff is just uh, seat of the pants kind of observations you have out in the world and you jot them down in your notebook or on your phone and, and they show up in prose someday. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to visit some of the questions that we have here, and two of them are actually about the, the title, and I'll just read them straight from here. It says, um, <clears throat> ha, da, da, da. does he have something new? Oh, no, sorry. How did you settle on the Knicks as the title, and did the myth of the Knicks originate in your life from somewhere, or did you research this myth? So about my life, uh, sort of both. Um, my uh, mother's family um, emigrated from Norway to the U.S. Uh, they, they settled first in Minnesota and ultimately um, ended up in eastern Iowa, um, which is where uh, a lot of them still are. And, uh, and so I know I had this Norwegian history, but, uh, but we are completely severed from, from that part of the family, the, the Norwegian, um, the, the folks back in Norway. Uh, uh, and so I didn't, it's not like I grew up with these stories, but I just knew that I had, I had family that, and, and, and that's where they were from. And so when I would encounter like Scandinavian stories later in life, I, I just kind of would remember them. Uh, it was just kind of part of my history. And so um, the story of the Knicks, the story of the, um, of the drowning stone, uh, the story of the Nissa, the house spirit, uh, they were just like stories I heard along the way, somewhere along the way, and just, they always stuck with me. Uh, but then when I, when I decided to make Faye's father uh, a Norwegian immigrant, like my own great great grandfather, um, uh, I I, uh, uh, I went back and read much more about all of those myths just to make sure I had them correct. Um, and as for the title, uh, that <laughs> that became the title literally the day before my agent sent it out to publishers. It had had a different title for the ten years that I was working on it. Um, and uh, it was a title that I came up with because of the first sentence I wrote. Um, and it just stuck for the entire 10 year process. And in fact, on my computer here at home, um, that's still the name of the file is the old title. I, I haven't actually changed it, uh, but uh, it didn't work anymore. It, it, it maybe made sense for a book that I had envisioned 10 years prior, but it didn't make sense for this book. And so my agent and I were going back and forth on potential titles. And I, I said, how about the Knicks? And she's like, yes, that's the one. And so I kept on expecting the title to change somewhere in the editing process. I expected some genius to come up with something amazing and it just kind of flew through and, and nobody had a problem with it. So it stopped. Fair enough. <laughs> um, so we also have a lot of questions here about your characters and um, people curious about your relationship with your own mother or the inspiration for Faye's character. I, I should say uh, I'm, I'm practically contractually obligated to say that my mother did not abandon me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <but> she's, <laughs> she didn't even know what, uh, what I was writing about until after I had a contract. And then uh, I called her with the good news that, uh, that I sold the book. And she's like, great, what's it about? And I said, it's about a mom who abandons her son. And there's this long pause. <laughs> she said, Nathan, you know what people are going to think? I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, but no, my mom, my mom never abandoned us. She never, as far as I know, abandoned anything. She's a wonderful, supportive person. Um, uh, and she's a big fan of the book. Uh, 
Um, so, but but uh, the, the 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 emotions that I gave to Samuel regarding that um, come come instead from my own experience in in, in childhood, um, where we would move around a lot. Uh, it was for my dad's work. Um, uh, growing up, we moved every two years or so. So. Um, from Cedar Rapids, Iowa to, to or no, from yeah, Comanche, Iowa to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, to Des Moines, Iowa, to Chicago, to St. Louis, to this, this weird stop in a in very southern, rural southern Oklahoma, Wichita, Kansas, and that was all before our high school. Um, and so every two years, like all of my friends would disappear. Um, and um, it's, it, and so like, even though I was the one leaving when you're a kid, it kind of feels like you've been left behind, like you've been abandoned, you know? And so that kind of loneliness, like having to be the new kid, and if anybody out there has ever been the new kid, you know how brutal that can feel. Um, so being that person every couple of years and the kind of loneliness associated with that, that's what I gave to Samuel. Um, uh, and, uh, and kind of, you know, pumped it up a little bit uh, for dramatic purpose, but, uh, but yeah, so my mom's wonderful, but, uh, but we moved a lot. And so that, that's, that's, that's how that got trans kind of transferred into fiction. If that, does that make sense? Yeah, no, totally. That's really interesting. Um, from the ending, having, having spent 10 years writing it, did you know, and I mean, I even, when I read your um, interview with um, Irving, you discussed that you were kind of um, kind of enamored in the fact that he knows where his books are going from the beginning of it. And uh, I just wonder about your process or, or maybe you, you're not even sure what the process is since this is your first book, but when did you figure out what the end was going to be? And, and also the periwinkle um, connection, where, where did that come from? <laughs> Uh, I thought I knew the ending. I, I thought I had come up with the ending on a bike ride in Chicago one summer, like two years before I actually got to it. I was like, oh, that's where I'm going. Now I get it. And, uh, and I wrote towards that ending and I finished it. I, 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 I wrote it and it was terrible. Two years later, it was terrible. It didn't work anymore. Um, and at, as happens, the book kind of shifted underneath me during those two years. And so I had to kind of go back and reevaluate and throw away those 60 pages and figure something else out. Um, and that sounds frustrating. I know when, it, when I would tell my students about like adventures in revision and I would say things like I had to throw out 60 pages, they would just be like, think I was uh, crazy. Uh, but I, I like that, that process because then you, you kind of get to figure out something new and uh, unexpected. And, and my, and yeah, I'm jealous of John Irving who, um, who, who can write such fabulous books and know where he's going the entire time. I, I don't do that. Um, I find that when I, um, when, I, when I have a plan, when I have an outline, when I know what I'm writing towards, um, it ends up kind of sucking a lot of the life out. Um, and I, it's much better if I write in kind of improvisational mode. Um, and so I, when I sit down to write in the morning, I, I usually have a scene. I have a character or two and a setting and a general idea of what's going on, but I kind of allow the dynamic to play out on paper and and then see what happens and 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 be mindful of opportunities and free associate and see what happens um and sometimes that leads to really interesting places like i, I generally think like if i can surprise myself in the chair then hopefully i can surprise the reader too i can entertain the reader if i feel entertained while i'm writing it um but sometimes it leads down cul-de-sacs where, where i thought it was going to be some profitable subplot so which is why like the the first draft was a thousand pages and why I could cut 400 pages from the novel. It's just a lot of extraneous material. It's just a, a side effect of my own, my own process. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't really, uh, I don't really know, at least for this book, I didn't know where it was, was, was heading. And, um, and the, the periwinkle thing, you're right to ask me about that. That that's, that's not something I had planned from the beginning. I had two separate characters and it was somewhere along the way. I was just like, Oh, duh, of course they're the same person. Um, and, uh, and, and then revised it, um, revised it to make it seem like that was intentional. The nice thing about revision is that you get to pretend that you were smart the entire way when most of mostly I was just kind of floundering. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> um, so I do have another question about, um, something very specific. So the castle of no return. Yeah. Can you can you discuss that a little bit? Nobody has any idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> My God! All right. All right. <laughs> uh, I can't believe I actually have this. Uh, this was my first book. 
The Castle of No Return. I wrote it when I was in like second grade. Brilliant. It's a, uh, it's a choose your own adventure book. And uh, I did my own illustrations. <laughs> oh my gosh, amazing. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and yeah, and it, it, uh, it won a prize, uh, it, you know, and, and the teacher read it in front of the class and the class all voted, uh, which, you know, which choices they wanted to make. And I just sat in the back, just giggling. Cause I thought it was the best thing that ever happened. Um, and, uh, yeah, I still, I still had it. Um, I fished it out of my, my parents' attic, uh, uh, after the Nick soul. I think I was like, I'm, I'm going to want that again. Um, because I describe I describe it pretty faithfully in, in the book. Um, it's, it's uh, the thing that uh, Samuel writes when he's a child, um, and it convinces him he wants to be a writer. So yeah, it's it's a pretty faithful, um, a pretty faithful uh, expl- or, um, uh, description of my f- my first literary, um, my first my first attempts at uh, at, at literary greatness. <laughs> Amazing! That's 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 awesome. Um, I do have a question here. They want to know since you the Nix is. I mean, it's not based on you, but there's a lot of you in it. Mm-hmm. And um, are you working on something else? And if you are, uh, how are you? Is it completely different? Is it similar? It's it's. Yeah, I am working on something else. Though so that's that's. Um, I've kind of I've, I've put it off a little bit. Um, it's it's kind of marinating right now. Um, but I'm I'm I've been working a lot on the on the television adaptation of the Knicks, and, and that's very very exciting fun work. So I, I'm I'm doing that right now. Um, but, uh, but, uh, if, 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 if I, if I could pivot the camera over here, there's this whole wall of note cards, um, for the next, for the next novel. And right now it's just kind of the brainstorming, um, um, uh, mode. Uh, I'm just trying to, trying to think up scenes, um, and, and see where, see where it takes me. Uh, it's, it, I think it's going to be different, but I don't know. Like I said, like these, the books tend to change from under, uh, you know, out from underneath me. So, um, so I don't know. I don't want to say too much because it could be completely, completely different. But I will say that I have like a couple characters that I really like and a setting that I really like, and uh, and I like being in the world. So we'll see. Wonderful. Um, the Girly Book Club was completely split on this book, and we, you and I, were discussing this earlier. But when we do read literary fiction, it it's always the case. There's always the camp of people who loved it, and a camp of people who might not have finished it or did finish it and didn't love it. And that's just the nature of any book, of course. Um, but we had um, two chapters in particular, Melbourne, Australia. They said the only thing they could agree on was that it wasn't their favorite book. Then we, <laughs> <laughs> then I'm just being brutally honest my here. Cities. I, I went there on my tour and I had such a great, loved it. I'm glad none of my members came out to your, um, to your book signing then. Oh yeah, no kidding. <laughs> but, um, conversely, Baltimore said that this was the first book that they had ever read that they all agreed was fabulous. So, <laughs> Baltimore. So yeah, I mean, clearly, very, very different ideas um, on on whether they loved it or didn't love it. But um, I have another question here for you, and they want to know how you researched the '70s to include it in the book. I mean, the '60s, right? Sorry, um, the '60s. Uh, yeah, I, um, I guess I, well, I, I, I read every book I could find on 1968, every book I could find, especially on Chicago in 1968. There's a documentary or two, um, uh, that, uh, that I, that I, that I, that I watched several times. Um, and, and then just a lot of, uh, a lot of just, uh, you know, old fashioned research. Like I, I spent lots of afternoons at the Chicago History Museum Research Library, um, where they, they, they give you these like white gloves and you go through the archives and you, you have to request this material like three days in advance so they can bring it out of cold storage and bring it up to room temperature before you look at it. And it's, you know, they have just boxes and boxes of stuff from convention week in 1968 in Chicago, um, you know, underground newspapers and pamphlets and um, handbills and uh, letters and uh, photographs. Uh, in fact, that's where, where I found the photograph that ended up being on the cover of the book was was through that research. Um, and uh, and I guess uh, I, I, I just, I, I read as much as I could, um, and I read all of it, and I, that, that took me three years probably, just that part of it. And I was writing other parts of the novel while I was doing it, and I, I guess I knew I was ready to write when I, I 
my wife has this phrase that I like. She's a, she's a musician. She's a classical musician. And she says she'll, she'll practice a piece until she has it under her fingers. Mm -hmm. um, which, which, you know, it's like when, when the knowledge is sort of in your body um, uh, rather than, than in, in your mind, like you don't have to consciously think about it too much. It's just you, you get to react. And so I guess I, 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 um, I, I researched Chicago in 1968 until I felt like I had it under my fingers, uh, until I could, I could write and I feel like I could write with some authority and not have to constantly be checking um, outside sources to make sure I was right. Okay. And I see um, a question now about whether, whether my wife was the inspiration for Bethany, who's also a classical musician. I'll say, yeah, it's- Good <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's, um, uh, it's a short distance. If you're married to a classical musician, it's a short distance to make the love interest in your novel a classical musician. I needed Bethany to be a soloist though. My wife plays the bassoon and there are very, very few solo bassoonists in the world. Uh, so I had to make her a violinist, but she did help me with all of the music stuff. Very good. Um, going back to uh, just talking about how the, our membership was split around the book, one thing that everybody did agree on is, is how incredibly talented you are as a writer. And even though we're, perhaps they didn't love the story, they were really um, drawn in by the writing. And I just wanted you to comment on kind of like, because there's some really long sentences in this book. And, and I loved hearing that every sentence belonged there, but just maybe a little comment on your writing style. Yeah, um, I, I, I love long, long sentences. And, and it's, um, it's I, I love what a sentence can do, um, I guess is the way I should say it. I love how in one clause, you can dilate time and really expand it. And then, and then in the very next clause, um, you know, race to a finish um, and, uh, and speed up time. Um, how you can build in um, suspense um, into a sentence, how you can build to a punchline in a sentence. Uh, um, or just the, the, the kind of rhythmic effect of, of having very long sentences followed by a few very short ones, or one incredibly short one. Um, I, I love the, the kind of musical potential um, of, of sentence structure. So I, yeah, it's something I, I pay a lot of attention to. Um, it's, and it's obviously not something that I'm expecting readers to really pick up on too much. It's really supposed to be um, a, a just kind of a voice in your head, a rhythm in your head that, that, that happens when you're reading and not necessarily conscious, but just that the, that the, um, that the book has a kind of uh, cadence to it. Um, mm -hmm. I will say if anybody listened to the audio book, um, uh, uh, the, the narrator of the audiobook, uh, his name is Ari Fiakos, did an amazing job at capturing exactly kind of what I thought the book sounded like in my head. So if anybody, if anybody uh, heard it that way, it was, I, I thought he was fantastic. I love that and how it all ties back to music. And um, Emma here has said that she thought your writing style is very fluid, so. Thank you, yeah, I, I part of, Part of that is, and that's really, really intentional. Like I, I read everything I write out loud, and if, like, sometimes, uh, sometimes the the tongue will tell you things that your eyes or your brain can't tell you. Um, uh, if I if I read a sentence out loud and I, I find myself tripping over it a little bit, then that's a signal to me that something's not quite right in the cadence of the rhythm or even the vowel sounds, the consonant sounds of a, of a sentence. And it's and and so it's 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 a signal that I need to keep working on it. So yeah, it's, thanks. I'm, I'm, that makes me really, really happy that you thought that. Uh, um, that's, that's sort of what I'm going for as a kind of, uh, a kind of, kind of driving forward momentum, fluid kind of musical quality to it. That's so interesting. I've never heard an author tell me that, that they, they read the each line out loud. And is that because of the audiobook, or that's just how that's a personal? No, I've been doing that for years um, and I don't know I, I think I just found I found it very helpful very I don't know a long time ago um, where you know that phenomenon where like you look at a word document that you're really familiar with long enough that you stop actually seeing it you know yeah, you stop, yeah. you know uh, you stop and, and so typos can can slip by and you for don't sure. even um, and so because of that I like to change my media a lot so once I get used to it well I write everything longhand first um, and then I type it up. And then once I've gotten a little used to that, what it looks like typed up, I will change the typeface. I will change the font size um, and make it look different. Um, and I will read it out loud. And then I will read it. I will read it out loud to me. I'll read it out loud to my wife. Um, and uh, and 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 really, I don't know. Make it always seem different to me, so that I can 
a new way, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. The, um, the girls here, Sarah and, um, and Ariana said that they loved uh, Laura's voice and Ponage's voice on the audio. <laughs> did you get, oh. did you have anything to do with that? No, no, I didn't. Other than my producer emailed me and said she thought that this Ari guy would be great. And I, I, I just trusted her judgment. I'm very happy I did. Um, but yeah, he did a great Laura. He did a great Ponage. Um, and Ponage is especially difficult because, of course, there's that chapter late in the book that's, a, what, a 10-page sentence? It's all one sentence. <laughs> wow. um, and he, uh, and he, he, he mastered that was, that was That was very difficult to do, and he did it really, really well. Um, that, that's an example of one of those, like, I, mean, I don't know, I'm so enamored with, the sen with, with what a sentence can do at that moment. Oh, yeah. You hearing that? Yeah, just a second here. There we go. Go ahead. Sorry. One of those moments where, like, um, I was trying to find a way to be able to describe exactly how anxiety producing quitting the video game would be to Ponage. Um, and I, I, I just landed on this idea that, that if not only I could describe kind of his mental journey going through this process of unplugging, but if I could do it in a way where the syntax itself would cause anxiety, where the syntax itself would be, would feel overwhelming, then, then maybe I could push the reader a little bit towards Ponage's mindset. Uh, and so, yeah, and so casting it all in one sentence, this great monolithic sentence. I was hoping that, that the reader would maybe not even notice that it was all one sentence until like four or five pages in and realize there hadn't been an end stop yet and start wondering when it was gonna happen. Um, I know that, that's what my dad said anyway when he read it. He's like, I didn't, he, he had to go back and he, at some point he realized that there was no, that there was no period. He had to go back and reread it, which, which pleased me a great deal. Um. Rebecca just asks here, what, uh, what does Nathan hope that readers will take away from his book? Oh, I don't know. I don't think that's really up to me. Um, you get to do whatever, whatever you want with it. Uh, I know that, that the, that last chapter, I really kind of wore my heart on my sleeve a little bit. Um, and, uh, and, and, and some people dig that and some people don't, that's fine. Uh, but I figured after 600 some pages, I kind of got the right to, 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 to maybe be a little, if not, uh, to be sincere. And, uh, and so, you know, one of the, one of the things that, uh, that, that I thought was really important, uh, was that, uh, was, th was the power of, um, of trying to look at the world from other people's perspectives, uh, about uh, about not jumping to conclusions uh, about about people about trying to understand where they're coming from the history um, uh, and then also about kind of how easy it is for one's life to to uh, become something that you never intended and don't want um, I know that that was me for a long time um, uh, and uh, and it, it just a, just a series of very very small choices. Um, uh, you know, you decide at night to fire up World of Warcraft instead of, I don't know, hanging out with your significant other. Um, you decide in the afternoon to, um, I don't know, play, play video games instead of going to the gym. I mean, all those tiny, tiny little day-to-day -day stupid little decisions add up to a kind of life. Um, and, uh, and I think the thing that Samuel and Faye uh, uh, realize at the end is that you have to kind of unmake a lot of those decisions if you want the life that you want. And, and, and so, that's that's I mean it's something that was personal to me while I was uh, I was I was writing it, put it in the book. But whether whether that's a lesson that the reader wants to learn or not is completely up to them. Of course. Um, sorry, I'm just I've just got another question coming here quickly. Did Nathan have much to do with the book's cover? Oh, um, that was that was Oliver Monday, a brilliant designer uh, that works with uh, uh, Knopf. Uh, he he. He had a couple different ideas for a cover, and uh, I liked all of them. Uh, and they ended up going with uh, with with this one, um, and I'm I'm totally in love with it. I all I all I said was that I didn't want the cover to be too 60s. Mm. Uh, I didn't want it to signal like it was some like it was a 60s kind of hippie book, you know. Um, uh, I wanted it to signal that it's contemporary, that it deals with contemporary things, um, and uh, and so so yeah, I. Um, 
and, and when I saw it and the way they worked in this photograph from the 60s, but also the type, typography is quite contemporary, I guess I was a big fan. So they didn't really have to convince me too much. I just loved it right away. And does the um, book cover differ in, because usually country by country, it's sometimes different. Is it the same everywhere? Uh, no, it's not. It's the same in most places, but um, uh, you can go to my website and see all the covers that exist so far. It's nathanhill.net. And, uh, and so far, uh, Germany has um, a, a kind of more staid uh, uh, cover. It's like a gray cityscape. Um, France has an incredibly entertaining cover with the ugly, the, a, a guy, a young man wearing the ugliest American, American flag sweater that you've ever <laughs> seen. Um, hilarious. I would recommend everybody checking it out. I, I kind of love it. Um, and, uh, and who else? Um, the Hebrew edition just came out and uh, that they changed the cover on that one too. But, but otherwise, it's, uh, most everybody else have kept, have kept it the same. Sorry, uh, can you just say your, uh, your website again? Because there's that um, John Irving interview on your website, and I encourage everybody to read that. That's excellent. Sure, it's uh, nathanhill.net. Perfect, thank you. Um, there's a couple more questions, which we'll get to very quickly. Um, probably have about two or three more questions. So this is from Emma, and she says, is there a character from the book that you actually ended up cutting out completely in those 400 pages? Cutting out completely, uh, huh? Yes, yes, there was. There was a there was a a love interest of Samuel's before Bethany. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, it was kind of the Rosalind to Bethany Bethany's Juliet. You know, it's it's uh. Uh, um, a, a girl in school that he has a crush on, but is way out of his league. Um, and uh, it ended up, she ended up not being necessary because he becomes kind of um, uh, uh, smitten with, with, uh, with, with Bethany quite quickly. And so it, it sort of, um, it, it didn't need to be there. Uh, so, so yeah, there, there used to be that. And, uh, and it made that section of the book, part two, which I think is the longest section, it made it even longer. Um, I mean, that, that section, part two, was almost a novel in itself. I mean, I think it was like 200 pages in my first, first, uh, um, uh, first draft. Um, there was another, there was a much bigger role for, uh, for Larry, uh, Laura Potsdam's boyfriend. Okay. Uh, there was there was one um, there was <laughs> there was there was there was a time when Larry like mugged Samuel in the woods uh, and like threatened him, you know, to stay away from Laura for you know in, in one version of the novel, and that, that ended up just not working at all. It's one of those things that's really funny while you're writing it, and then you read it like a week or two later, and you're just like, no, no, no. Um, so he had a, he used to have a much much bigger role that got to that had to be scaled back quite a bit. And maybe you can't tell me or tell us rather, but I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask. What was the original title? <laughs> oh, the original title was all right. So you remember the scene um, in 2004 where they're carrying the coffins um, in that march to Madison Square Garden. Um, that was the first scene I wrote, uh, and it was inspired by an actual march that happened in 2004 when I had just moved to New York City, and so I witnessed it. Um, and, uh, and I wrote the sentence, um, there's a body for each of us, uh, yeah. and that persists as, um, uh, as the, the name of that section of the book. And so that was the title, A Body for Each of Us, was the title for a very, very long time. Oh, wow. That's interesting. <laughs> um, one of my last questions is there is a lot of reviews, a lot of reviews. You've done a lot of media um, before and after the book came out, uh, mostly good press, but of course there's, there's some bad reviews out there. How does that feel? How does that affect you? You have a 4.11 Goodreads rating, which is very, very high. And so I'm just like wondering, do you follow that stuff? Are you Googling your name? What is that like? I, I did when the, like the, the first week the book was out, I, I read everything. Um, because it was just such an unusual thing to um, uh, to have anybody talking about anything I had written, you know, it was it was it was magical, you know. Um, and then, um, yeah, I, I guess very quickly I I stopped reading it because uh, I don't know. I feel like it's it's sort of unnatural. This like 
feeling of like people talking about you on the internet is just it's just I don't know if our if our emotional equipment is necessarily um, equipped to to deal with it. Um, I know that I, I I was invited by by John Irving to come to Toronto and do an event with him on the same day. Uh, somebody wrote something really shitty on Goodreads, and of course, the rest of the day, I wasn't thinking about the John Irving email. I was thinking about this Goodreads thing. It was just like it was like there's there's this big cloud over my head for the entire day. My wife was just like, "You have got to stop reading this. You know, um, uh, it's not healthy." And uh, and so yeah, I, I kind of stopped. I stopped reading it. Um, uh, you know, the reviews. Uh, uh, I'm I'm so happy that so many of the reviews are good. I know that some of them are bad. I haven't read them, so I don't know why. I don't know the argument. Um, I, I know I know that like in December, uh, uh, one magazine uh, called the Knicks the most overrated book of the year. In the same week, another magazine called it the most underrated book of the year. So you kind of <laughs> like it's there's there's a lot of like in the eye of the beholder kind of stuff. And of course, it's a it's you know it's trying to be a work of literature so it's not going to appeal to everybody and that that's okay um and uh and i'm i'm happy when anybody gives it a chance but um you know i i'm on twitter i don't you know i'm not incredibly active when i'm on twitter and people say people tweet at me very nice things and that's always delightful so my last question for you is who is your favorite author or book oh geez <laughs> Uh, hardest question of the night. Um, <laughs> uh, I'd say, like, you know how there are certain books that just hit you at the right time in your life, you know, like, like, like a certain song or a certain band, like if it, if it got to you at a later time, maybe it wouldn't have penetrated as much, but it just got you at the right moment. Um, there, there are a few books like that for me that just hit me exactly at the right moment in my life for them to be very powerful experiences for me. Um, I think... Uh, among them, I mean, John Irving's up there. I, I started reading him when I first moved to Iowa City when I was an undergrad um, and thinking about maybe being a writer. And here John Irving was, he had lived in Iowa City for a very long time and he wrote about young men who want to be writers. And so it just felt, I don't know, possible. Um, uh, I, uh, um, I, I So I loved uh, The World According to Garp. Um, I loved uh, A Widow for One Year. Um, and then when I was in graduate school, I, shamefully late but i finally discovered uh not discovered i finally read virginia wolf um yeah. to the lighthouse and mrs dalloway are two yeah. miracles of, a bo of books you know um and uh in college i i, I read a lot of uh, you know uh donald barthelme uh the american writer american short story writer he, i think he wrote a novel or two um his sh short story collection 60 stories and 40 this just blew me away i love them so much um and uh and then Later, uh, I, I, I finally read David Foster Wallace's The Pale King. Um, I read it, you know, he, he had passed away by the time it came out, of course, and I, hadn't, I had never read him, and I read The Pale King and thought, oh my God, this is unbelievable. So I went back and read everything that he'd, he'd written, and, and so that was The Pale King ended up being a very important book for me, too. So, um, yeah, probably, I don't know, that doesn't really answer your question. I'm giving you a spectrum, many books that I've really loved over the years. Well, like you said, it's a very difficult question, so I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> um, I just want to thank you for taking the time to come and speak to us tonight, and thank you for persevering and spending 10 years writing this book, because it's one of the best books I've read this year, and I read a lot of books. So. Thank you for through all 620 pages. I, I appreciate it, Thanks for, and thank you for having me. It's been a, a real pleasure. Awesome. Well, thank you, ladies, for joining us tonight and for asking all your really interesting questions. and. Uh, have a good night. <laughs>